So I will restate the obvious. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Rory Freddy, and uh, he is a developer evangelist for Microsoft, and he's going to be telling us about programming for accessibility. Thank you, Rory. So I've done this talk now. This is the third time. I did it Linux Conf, I did it PostgreSQL Conf, and I did it now. And I, I think I think the important concept to understand is that um, each audience needs to be aware of this. If you're a Linux developer, Postgres, or um, Python, you still need to be aware of how to cater for accessibility. And you'll see in the presentation why. So you can go to acca.ms forward slash Linux Conf. I was way too lazy to change that on every single conference. Um, and it has some nice added material there. We've got some labs and uh, link to the labs that I did on the first day of um, Linux Conf and also the slides and some other niceties there. And you can snap scan it also, because that's a millennial thing. I think some of you millennials like to do. I was, like, I was actually saying, do I take a selfie now? And then I, I went, Rory, be true to yourself. You've never taken a selfie in your life. Now, if you do it now, everyone's going to be like, eh, midlife crisis, here it is. <laughs> so I'm not going to selfie. And why are we here in Open Source Week? And an important thing to understand is that we have actually been open source since 2004. But we're just a little bit more vocal about it now. Um, some key dates to identify. Um, 2004, we actually mentioned the words in the back of my t-shirt, Microsoft loves Linux. And ironically, in 2018, we started to, in 2019, finally, we started to notice that we were actually becoming a Linux dev shop. And we run more Linux now on Azure than we do Windows. So we really do <laughs> love, love Linux. We're in uh, 2018, a really big pivotal point there is that we bought a small company called GitHub. And if you, go, if you sign up to GitHub now, the underlying churning of GitHub Enterprise and GitHub for DevOps is Azure DevOps, which will do um, a demo on those. And you can sign up for free. If you're an open source developer, you get 10 pipelines for free. Your entire project is for free. So open source or publicly facing projects. But why am I here? Other than, you know, I like people and I like people liking me. But I'm here because I had a midlife crisis, an early midlife crisis. It's getting there. It's, it's coming right. And part of my midlife crisis, I bought a BMW, a BMW 335i. So if you want to know what not to do on a midlife crisis, don't buy a car. They're a depreciating asset. But um, as part of the, the car, I, I have to adjust it. So you put a false floor there, and then you take the pedals and you, you kind of bolt them on to the actual uh, pedals. And don't worry, they've only failed once driving on the M1 <laughs> fast. <laughs> so they've only failed once. But um, then I can actually drive my midlife crisis. Um, and and th th this is kind of like the, the theme of the, the presentation because this was bolted onto the actual car. And I, and I bolted on a lot of things in my life. Uh, here is me bolting on a chair to reach um, to present at the University of Bloemfontein. And here is me actually at one of my employees either getting coffee or tequila. I don't really remember which one. I think it might be coffee by the look of like, you know, urgency on my face. And, and the, the bolt-on carries, carries on happening. Um, and, and it's been like this also for a lot of other industries. It's been like this for programming for many years. When we've seen this with assistive, te assistive technologies for limited movement for people with uh, disabilities or need accessibility. So for example, the sip and puff switch. So you have the, the ability to, with using your cheek muscles, actually drive the computer, and it's you know, made famous by a lot of people that you see who don't have any mobility, and where they only really have actions of their, their jaw. The Orbitac, Orbitouch keyless keyboard. So if you have limited mobility, you can kind of move it around to the, the key that you want with, with uh, a lot of ease. With visual impairments, also similarly. You have the refreshable Braille keyboard. It's pr quite a marvel to, to watch. And then the screen reader software. So the, the two main software is JAWS and NV Access. And I remember s downloading this and switching on for the first time. And this thing just went at me 
with a lot of verbosity, and it is a, a, a little bit overwhelming to, to hear exactly how much information you can, you, can, can, uh, you can get through. And the problem is it's just that. You can overwhelm with the information. It's an ongoing theme in the session to how to actually program for accessibility, to not have that verbosity with your screen reader software. As part of my midlife crisis, I also bought one of those uh, BMR scales. <laughs> Not, not a clever idea. And um, I put the BMR scale down, and it had like a lot of settings. And uh, the one setting said uh, height, um, 4 foot 1 or 120 centimeter for you actually real world people. Uh, 95 kilos, I've lost how many pounds that is? That may be like 130, 140, you know, work it on your head. And then it had a little setting, because to calculate the BMI, it has to know what, what you're supposed to be in. And it had a little crawling baby, and it had an adult man. And I was like, ooh, OK. It's not going to end well. So I put the, I think I put the, either the baby or the child or the adult man, any which way I get on. And it's busy calculating. And you can see it's got a machine model like a, embedded in the actual chip. And it came out, and you like, I, I literally threw the, the, the scale away. It was so offensive. Like it, it uses words that I don't think that you should actually use. But at the end of the day, it also kind of made me feel a little bit despondent. Like, like my hero did when he joined the DC universe. <laughs> He's out. It's all right, OK? He's out. Um, because we were in the fourth industrial revolution. How are we all supposed to kind of benefit or engage or do that when I can't bolt onto a, uh, with a scale? So I, I, like my other hero here, um, I decided that it, I would do and uh, do the right thing, and I've been speaking on accessibility driven by the, the need to kind of stop bolting on. I don't want to have to bolt on to the fourth industrial revolution, and maybe I can convince you also not to have to do it. So what are we going to do today? We're going to look at inclusive design, which is really old, the concept. Inclusive design was created at the time in the 1920s because the American US uh, Air Force wanted to create cockpits when planes were becoming popular for all of their pilots. So they took a survey of 4,000 people and they found them the average for that and they just built all of their cockpits to the, the average. In the 1930s and 40s, there were so many accidents. In the 50s, they reinvestigated what had happened and they realized when they took that 4,000 people, let's find that, that person that is the average and there wasn't an average. There never was an average. So then they, they made it adjustable that you can adjust with your, your uh, seat to get into the, the million plus combinations for each of us. And we were benefiting to that day because user-centered user design actually created the chairs that you are in your car, those unique combinations. So it's pretty, pretty old uh, inclusive design. We're going to go through that. Then we're going to look at websites. So why website? We're at a Python conference, but web is still the portal to a lot of our engagements with our, our customers and clients. Then we're going to look at AI. That scale had a model. <coughs> that scale had a model. And that model had to be aware of inclusivity, accessibility, and also bias, because it kind of was being biased against me. And we're going to look at how to drive and focus on excluding and including um, awareness into AI. Inclusive design. So let's start with some definitions. So what is accessibility? And accessibility isn't just the little icon on Microsoft PowerPoint saying you have accessibility issues. And guess what? You can just go fix for me, and Microsoft PowerPoint or Word would do it for you. Accessibility is the design of products, services, environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience them. It's not to design for disabilities. It's not to kind of uh, design around them. It's to create the process of innovation that you don't really need to. And uh, this is an important concept, because if you have inclusive products and service design, it will lead to innovation. And we're going to see how you can actually go about that journey. And like I said, core concept, disability is not a personal health condition. When you go to a doctor and you say, I'm not feeling too well, he won't look at you and say, ah, you've got disability. It only existed when I was on that scale, when it couldn't actually understand what, what the difference was, though, because disability is a mismatch human interaction for the, the scale, though. It didn't cater for my specific needs. 
let's go through the inclusive design steps, and we'll go through a design process and a journey. So one is recognize exclusion. So understand the product that you're creating, the website you're going to create, exactly who does it exclude. And I, I love you JavaScript developers, because when I ask you, OK, what's your go-live strategy? And they go, 70% of devices. OK, what about the other 30%? Mm -mm. No, nope, not, not catering for that, though. So we're going to recognize the exclusion. Solve for one extent to many, and we do this with persona spectrums, which we're going to go through now. And once you solve for a persona spectrum, you can extend it to many. Learn from diversity. This is an interesting concept. And w what it's trying to basically say is take the mindset that diversity actually creates innovation and start actually going down the process to identify how your company can be diverse. So the persona spectrum. So this comes from the US uh, disability stats. And it identifies people without the use of an arm, uh, right arm. And it breaks them into three categories. So we have an, uh, one arm in amputee or someone born without an arm. Then we have an arm injury. Uh, I'm suffering from really bad rotator cuff for 22 years of just clicking a mouse. Yeah, no, mouses are evil, apparently. Who knew? Um, and then a new parent. So any, any parents here? Yeah, yeah, you're disabled, hey, because you're like financially, <laughs> mentally, physically. But try open a door with a, with a baby in your hand, and it's, it's a similar concept. So if you go to your manager and you say to them, I would like to code towards the one arm, uh, the person, the amputee, he'll say, yeah, but there's only 26,000 of them in the US that can't really justify the, um, the need for that. But then you say, no, I'm coding for the the mobility spectrum, and guess what? In arm injury, there's 13 million, and in new parent, there's an, adother, an, an additional 8 million. So catering for that spectrum and extending it to everyone without mobility issues is actually catering for 21 million. And this is an important concept because the total population of people who have accessibility issues is a, nearly a billion, and that includes people with learning disabilities, cognitive, and also uh, elderly, that's a billion people. Now, if you take that billion people and you take their friends and families and everyone who's heavily involved in them and who's, who helps them on a day-to-day -day basis, that's more than half the world. So now you start to understand that the population that you're programming for, you're, you're actually designing for, is the entire world. And that medium, that, that 4,000 people, doesn't actually exist. What you're doing is you're just making the plane unflyable. Once we have our persona spectrums, we superimpose them on a, a customer journey. I hope all of you do this for your, your websites and your apps. So we've got your customer journey. You've got registration, navigation, and checkout. So registration, site landing, preferences, registration, help, login. Then you've got navigation, search products, add cart, possibly help. Checkout, checkout, shipping. And then obviously, a lot of places do experience. They take a survey, say, did we meet your expectations? And ironically, if you hover over something too long, guess what? They're going to phone you and say, why didn't you buy that product? So you take your personas and you superimpose them. And then the interesting thing is that the expectation of the norm journey changes. Because now you start to actually add innovation. You go, woof, site landing. I need a responsive page. Because guess what? Most people with accessibility issues actually look at their device on a mobile in responsive view. Then I need, uh, under preferences, look at the font and color options, because one out of 20 men are actually colorblind. Um, and then also, I can make the font bigger to cater for the elderly. The capture, and I know what Google's trying to do with the capture. It's trying to actually get me to identify stop signs. Because like, there is some conspiracy out there to identify stop signs, because maybe it's too difficult. But I'm tired. If you can just tell them, please, just, give, just, just rotate it. Identify something else. So a capture. Then the accessibility help desk to phone to say, I can't access your, your website. I needed accessibility uh, help. And then the logon, single sign-on. So they don't just one button click. You don't have to type in a password. Because typing a password for someone um, for mobility issues is, can actually take more than the uh, 30 seconds you need. It can take up to minutes just to type that out. Uh, search products, voice search, add the voice capabilities. Add to cart, one button access, help, callback. Um, check out also one button access, 
SMS and email alerts. And then finally, under experience, instead of having a survey, you have an AI adjustment. And this is a new concept that is coming through to uh, a lot of your worlds. An AI would monitor, wait a second, this person has custom accessibility needs, and then will adjust the entire flow to cater for that. How do we do that? And we've had talks at this OSS week on PWAs, on TensorFlow, on all of those things. You literally adjust and you take, and we'll see how someone does it later, you take cognizance of that person's abilities and you scan in them visually or auditory of their needs. Website accessibility. So why is the web changing? And one would like to think that it's altruism, the, you get the stick and the carrot, and we're doing it via carrot. But I've already seen what GDPR has done to the industry, and a lot of us are actually kind of reacting with the stick. Like you get a pop-up there saying cookies, 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 and I, I now know which sites are storing my cookies, and I'm very efficient at just going to the, the right-hand side and pressing the, the, drop, uh, the close button to say, okay, okay, I trust you, K, 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 K. So the carrot by Bill Gates, for most of human history, we put our innovative capacity into improving the quantity of life. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving the quality of life. So we have evolved to a higher level of human consciousness, which I would like to believe is the reason why we're doing website accessibility, except we also have legislation, which is coming next year in 2020. And remember how hard GDPR hit? So this is going to hit also. So you have the US Central uh, Century in, uh, Integrated Digital Experience Act, and the EU a Parliamentary Directive on Digital Accessibility that says by 2020, all publicly facing mobile and websites will be accessible to WCAG 2.1 AA requirements, or up to $100,000 fine every single day, which Canada has started to enforce. Yes, yes, we're going to have an accessibility consultant soon, making a lot of money off that, because I'm quite sure who here has even heard of WCAG. One. Okay, so, yes, if you need a consultant, I'm available after hours. <laughs> it's really not that difficult, and I'm going to show you how. So what is WCAG? It's old. It was released in 1999. And it focused really on kind of the, the mobility and the visual impairments, and then they extended it also there in 2008 to morph principles and guidelines. And finally, they realized, wait a second, the world has moved on because we're starting to identify entire spectrums around that. The person can't just be not able or unable. They can be in something in between. So it created the WCAG 2.1, which also introduced new criteria for uh, mobile sites, for low visibility, and learning disabilities, ADHD, autism. A lot of the entire spectrum now is catering for that. And this is where we want to hit. We want to hit WCAG, and we, we want to do AA. So you're, you're questioning, isn't AA a battery? Is it something else in there? So let's go through the compliance levels. The base compliance level A deals with the most basic web accessibility features, fonts, colors, um, tab indexes for your actual uh, tabbing through a site. Level AA signifies the biggest and most common barriers for disabled users, captioning your videos, um, providing alternative media. And then level AA addresses the highest and most complex level of web accessibility. What you'll notice is that in a lot of videos now, there's a voiceover. So you have the captions, then you're also going to have VoiceOver, and we started to introduce it into a lot of Microsoft products, and the, what the VoiceOver does, it gives context to people who aren't really visually impaired or uh, mobility impaired, and just tells them, wait a second, this is the context of that. And that's level AA. You, you're, you're catering for someone's accessibility requirements. WCAG has four main principles. Perceivable, can you see it? And we're going to go through examples of each one. Operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? And my best, because everything breaks on webs. Robust, it won't break future technologies. So perceivable. So this is an apex predator. My, my, my daughter actually wanted to get one. I go, do you know how violent these creatures are? She goes, cute kitten. I go, yes, for the beginning. But this is perceivable, and this is your alt text, your alternative text. And if you use the Microsoft products in Office and Word and also Azure, it has an AI in it that will actually tell you this is not cute cat, but cat. Because one of the, the, the biggest problems is the screen reader will actually read the, um, 
read that back as a cute cat when it's an apex predator. And this is one of the keys of perceivable. So let's look at colors. So using colors to indicate errors or info mes uh, messages doesn't work for everyone because, like I said earlier, one out of 20 men are colorblind, one out of 200 women. So on the left, you, on the right, you have an email address which is incorrect. On the, the left, you have what someone sees here who's colorblind and it's not perceivable. We also have my, my hero here, Ron Swanson of Parks and Recreation. And if you know him, he likes meat, carpentry, and um, whiskey. Um, if you know him, he doesn't laugh. He's a, he's a very serious boy. And um, this caption underneath there is incorrect because you should be captioning your, your videos. You shouldn't just be captioning it as in chucking it in to your nearest video hosting site and hoping that it works, because chances are, as a South African accent, and I've tested this on so many times, it doesn't work with a South African accent. No one knows who we are or what we, what we stand for. And we have something called uh, vi um, Video Analyzer, Microsoft, and which can create the captions. And you'll see here later a video that I've done was in Video Analyzer. And then it gives you the option, it spits out the captions, and you can go and slightly change them if you, if you don't like that. Um, also, operable. So here's a really bad example of a hyperlink, probably the worst that I can actually do, because here someone actually pasted in the hyperlink into the actual newspapers. But hyperlinks are also important because if a screen reader were to read that hyperlink, what do you think it would actually read? It wouldn't really read the where are you going to. It would just tell the person, here's a hyperlink, click here. So hyperlinks can also be done incorrectly. My favorite keyboard, the Stack Overflow copy and paste. A lot of us have based our careers on that. But how many times have we taken our websites and tried to switch off the mouse and navigate through? An important concept to understand, you'll see there, is that if you don't understand how to navigate with a keyboard, leave it alone. Just set it to the basic default and don't touch it. Because what you'll do then, if you set it to tab index to one, it will just stay on that one. Operable, so here's a, a nice little succinct, semantically sound uh, bit of HTML code. You've got your heading section, then you have your list section. But I can also make this inoperable. So uh, tooling accessibility, accessibility tooling won't be able to read it. So I can do the same HTML in that. And I can make the, the P tags, instead of that, just putting BR tags. And I can also make that list not a list. So screen reader software that will go in there will actually not read that as a list. It will just put out one, two, and everything, and the person will be completely unaware of where they are in that. So there's a way to actually do that and make it unoperable, even though to us, visually, it's the, the correct uh, view that we're seeing. Understandable. So this is one of my pet projects is to collect, and you should follow me on Twitter, because I also published in there, is volume indexes or examples of poor user design. And he has a volume indexer that uh, sets your volume, where you actually have to pump down to the correct volume. Not as difficult as the one where you have to scream into your laptop to get the, the right volume. And the most difficult I've found so far is the one where you have to change the gears. Um, I have an automatic car. I don't even understand gears and what a clutch is. But you have to change the gears in the right syntax to actually get it to the right level. But these are, these are broad but kind of bad, bad examples, though. But to, to you, asking someone to click within a certain period, and when the person has limited mobility uh, and mouse usage, you, you need to understand that sometimes, even though that you make it understandable, it's not easy to use. Understandable also means no flashing of colors. Um, we have something called Immersive Reader, which puts every site into Kindle format. So you can actually, uh, line by line, be able to gray out everything else, and it will break it up into the syllables, give you textual representation, and speak back to it. So that's Immersive Reader, which is part of actually the free tier of Azure that you can start incorporating into your websites now. Robust, scalable, this is another apex predator. Actually, one of the only animals that has ever bitten me, other than the cocker spaniel. Dangerous little mutt. But in truth, when you speak to someone who has accessibility requirements, they, they, their primary PC, their primary platform, is mobile, and it's on landscape. So you need to make sure that you can actually landscape, and it won't break 
your website. So that's catering for, and I've discussed briefly, on how you can kind of, um, you know, not put a, a stumbling block in, in front of your, your website. But there's also the ability to cater for and code towards people with accessibility requirements to make it an, a, an accessibly rich internet application. And this is called ARIA for short. And ARIA breaks it into role attributes, live regions, landmark roles, and states and properties. And ARIA is actually older than HTML4. ARIA is markup. You've got a role, a state, and a property. And what you're doing is that you, you, you're actually speaking to the screen reader software, accessibility software, and you're saying something has changed. A carousel has changed, for example. There's a new bit of uh, text there. Or your button has clicked. Wait a second, it's still depressed. Or, like, for example, there, the actual input equals to first name, and that is required. ARIA is HTML5. Did you ever wonder why HTML4 took so long? Why they, they battled to find a semantically sound uh, upgrade to HTML and HTML5, and suddenly then they created it? Because what they did is they based it on ARIA. Because they already had a very good mechanism to go about to cater for accessibility requirements. So article tag in ARIA is actually HTML5. Um, Article in HTML5, header, navigation, complementary. So it already exists, and you can kind of get where I'm saying. So if you, if you write your application in um, HTML5 semantically sound, then you are ARIA compliant. It was very hard to find Lego renditions of Fight Club, but I did find one here. So this is actually the first rule of ARIA. And the first rule of ARIA is no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. And we'll go look through some examples, though. So if, if you're writing semantically sign HTML5, don't try and cater for people with accessibility requirements if you don't understand the usage. Do not use ARIA if existing HTML tags already provide the same functionality. The second rule of ARIA. Let's look at some examples. So uh, a role is a promise here. Yeah, ARIA pressed equals to false, mute, so it's a role is a promise. But principle two, ARIA, with that promise, you can also cloak and enhance, creating both power and danger. Now I'm in charge of the screen reader software. It's not really reading the actual uh, fields. I'm telling it what to read, so I can screw up, though. So that's an A tag. Assistive tech users perceive this element as an item in a menu, not a link, though. Because what I'm doing there, role equals the menu item, I'm telling the wait a second that A, that uh, hyperlink, is actually a menu item. I've kind of messed up. And then over there, another A tag, ARIA label. Assistive tech users can only perceive the contents of this ARIA label, not the link text. And then there's the link text. It's very easy if you add in and then forget about it to put a stumbling block there. Keep calm, it's demo time. Now, when I spoke to the organizer, they said, can you make it Python-esque? And I'm like, I can try. So I've got a, two demos I want to show you. And you can access all of these with Microsoft.com X pipeline samples. And the interesting thing is that we've open sourced our entire tool chain, DevOps and front end uh, tooling, uh, test tooling, to check for accessibilities. And it's called Accessibility Insights. So the first demo I'm going to show you using that X pipeline and very skillfully actually going behind here. So let's stop that there and escape. That's. Um, Azura, she's our Azura mascot. And I'm going here. So I've got my Visual Studio code, which is going that way. And this is the actual Git repo of that. And in it, I've got a sample page, which I'm going to start up. So the sample page here, open in default browser. Of course, we'll open on this side. Let's go there. Let's make it bigger. And this has the sample page there that we want to act on. Now, the, the, the two things that I want to uh, show you the tooling is one, um, these it's got some accessi accessibility rules. And I can open up Accessibility Insights for Web, which is the Chrome and Edge um, plugin, and I can run FastPass. Now, FastPass is meant to actually show you the the common 
uh, issues that you might encounter with your website and give you an overview of, wait a second, this is accessible or isn't accessible. So I'm going to run fast pass on that, and it's going to actually give me a, a, a report, and it's going to highlight, uh, it was on another tab, actually. It's going to highlight in red text. I can take a screenshot all of the accessibility issues. Now, I can go in there, and it can give me a rundown. Wait a second. You need to actually go uh, label attribute does not exist or is empty. And I can file the issue straight to GitHub, copy the failure details. And also, I can see if everything is uh, correct. Now, the tab index one, so it's got some nice tools there. And I can go to tab stops on. Now, if I tab index through there, it's going to say, wait a second. It can't tab to there also because the tab index is too high. So you can actually see about tab index. So this is the, the, the manual version. We also have, if I close this here, we also have the DevOps version. So these, these tests that I have here in this project actually test using Azure DevOps. And they test the same fast pass kind of uh, theory there of, uh, let's go here. Test WCAG, WCAG uh, compliance, so you can run it, the test locally on your PC. Alternatively, you can actually run it, and I've got the example here in Chrome, because I like to make my life difficult. You can run, run it actually as a, uh, let's go there as a DevOps project. So all of those rules are available there. So I can go into my .NET test, which I ran as part of Visual Studio. You can see it came back correct. And I'll get the view, and it will run it as part of my pipeline. Remember, open source projects get uh, Azure DevOps for free. And yeah, so there's our project, the exact same project. So I wanted to run this on uh, a Python-esque <laughs> project. So I started up my Python project there. You can see there I've got the code, I've got the build, and then it deploys it to the app services. And this is all for free on a Linux tier. We just, we just launched that like you know two weeks ago. So I'm not paying for it, which is great. And then I've got the little Python project here that I can start up. And then it will come back there. So I ran it actually on, <laughs> on this project, and I found a fault, which I'll log. In a, in a very political way, though. Um, yeah, so in this, and then I was like, what, what, what actually happened? And then if I go through here, it says, wait a second, this image doesn't have an alt. Because as part of the accessibility team, uh, maybe they, they forgot to do that. And then I can actually go into the repo of the, the site that, are, uh, that is, gets cloned as the sample site. And I can see there that the actual image source here doesn't have an alt. I can go in there, I can go edit, alt equals to, uh, let's go edit, not source, oh, wait, alt equals to uh, cloud new, and I can commit that, uh, commit, commit, and this will now go trigger against my Python DevOps project. Uh, let's go here. Let's hit refresh. And you've got continuous deployment, continuous integration. You add those Python uh, accessibility insights with X, and now you can actually pick that up. You don't have to have your manual intervention. So everything there does exist for you to start on your, your journey. So let's start there. And the uh, examples. The labs that I wrote um, for the day one for LinuxConf uh, that actually cover a lot of that is accessible on aka.ms forward slash LinuxConf, which will be also at the back. So that's the demo. T uh, pipelines have a, have a go at it. Start incorporating it into your Azure DevOps pipelines. AI. So let's look at that little model of my little um, mid-off crisis scale and see how we actually got to that point. So I've been kind of abusing AI in the last couple of years, and I've been using it to show that I'm not related to Tyrion Lannister at all in any way. And you can see there, this is him. And then with high confidence that these faces belong to two different people. I've also, in the beginning of my AI career, uh, career tried to make a pass the butter robot, Rick and Morty, with the uh, Amazon Alexa. 
And I, I did, I managed to create it. And um, the, the biggest problem in front of like a group of 100 people is I started screaming at the Alexa. And it was a pivotal part because I was getting frustrated and I was screaming at this thing and it was just returning back in monotone and not understanding that I was getting emotional. Now, I read up on it and a lot of assistive devices like these are used in homes to help people with accessibilities. And what the drive is, and you'll see uh, later, is that they're starting to change how your AI engages with you. Because key to that is to understand the person's individual needs. Because in truth, when you buy a device or you engage with a website or you, you engage with any tooling, you want the tooling to cater for your needs up front. You don't want to feel that you have to have a bolt on. So these stairs there, you can actually walk the, up them um, if you want to via the straight path, or you can actually climb the stairs. They, they evolve to your requirement, but we've also seen with ARIA that you can kind of do this the wrong way if you, if you don't understand. Because the basic principle behind that is that you have to understand the emotional context for an individual and engage with them with that AI. Bear with me here, because emotional context is much more difficult than what you think. It's not a zero or one sum game. It's not a happy or sad. If you understand that the person actually is under duress or stress or needs assistance, then you're you'll change, and we're seeing a lot of that with conversational AI, with language, with emotional AI engaging. The complexity of human emotion also uh, kind of uh, shows you how and why this is difficult. So over here we have the human emotional spectrum, and then right at the bottom we have the purple, which is boredom equals to disgust equals to loathing. And scientists have realized that um, boredom is actually a human instinct, meant that if we weren't foraging, we would actually get sick. Have you ever wondered why small children get bored and they get, so, they get physically ill? Because it's an emotional reflex to say, go do something. So if you are bored, and I have noticed a few of you yawning, I have arranged for the paramedics outside to give you a shot of Netflix <laughs> so we can carry it on, so it's, you can go now. But it's complicated. So how, how do we cater for AI? How do we create this awareness? In 2014 or 2013, the US Secret Service actually created an RFP to create an emotionally aware AI. And one of the key differentials, they said, is this needs to understand sarcasm because they realize that sarcasm is actually the highest form of wit, and it's a, a mechanism that they, if this thing can understand sarcasm, then it is an emotionally intelligent AI. So suddenly then, MIT created something called Deepmoji. So Deepmoji is, is an emotionally aware AI. So how they did that is they scanned in 55 billion tweets, your tweets, and because you're, you're actually creating emotional sense of AI, every time that you have a tweet, at the end of it you put a, an emoji out of it, you're, you're hashtagging it, the sentiment of the actual tweet. You're learning for the AI. So they scanned that in, they sanitized it to 1.6 billion, and then they broke it into categories. And the most important category that I found is the I'm not impressed face, AKA sarcasm. Because if this thing could understand sarcasm, then we have an emotionally intelligent AI. And we have the ability then to identify emotional intelligence. So I put it into, uh, you can go deepmoji.mrt.edu. So I put in the electricity is off again. Oh joy. And you can see there, they returned back the emotional sentiment flow and it indicated that it knew it was sarcasm and it knew that I was upset. So you can use this in a Docker image now. And this is being used more and more to analyze uh, engagements with customers, with, uh, with clients, to see, wait a second, are they being sarcastic? Or what is the sentiment flow for that? And you're doing, every time you send a, <laughs> a tweet, you're actually training it. So it's training as we speak. So now that we know that AI can understand emotion to an extent, we also know uh, we need to cater for emotion and accessibility, we can build it into our digital systems. Try scream at Siri, Alexa, Cortona. What it will do and respond back to you, it will start to uh, whisper back to you. And it will also give you an indication of its emotions and its awareness of your emotions. So if it knows you're frustrated and if it knows that you, uh, it isn't meeting your needs, it will adjust for that. And that's a great story because if I'm someone who only has my digital system to help, I need to cater for emotional engagement. But we also have the ability with TensorFlow and also other tooling to scan in and have that AI adjustment now. So this is TensorFlow.js. And what the person there is doing is that they're scanning in their hand 
uh, controls, they're custom hand controls, not American Sign Language. And then it's speaking to the Alexa on their behalf because he's visually, uh, sorry, um, auditory impaired. And this is done in the browser, in the web worker, with a PDA, uh, PWA, catering for accessibility. And this is the next level. Adjust your entire journey to cater for the individual's unique. And, but we, we, we're seeing that already. We're seeing that with facial scans. Um, how long until something scans that you're happy about your purchase or that you, unique, uni, uh, you need new, unique requirements? So in summary, how do we learn from get AI to learn from diversity. One, redefine bias as a spectrum. There was an employee there that had a AL model to help them to actually do employment. And after 10 years, they noticed that it had stopped uh, hiring women. And then they realized, wait a second, it had learned to be biased against women. Anyone with women in tech, it would stop hiring. And that bias needs human intervention. So you need to understand, redefine the bias, and then analyze your AI. Enlist customers to correct the bias. You're doing that right now with your deep emoji. Cultivate diversity with privacy and consent. If you're going to use client data, obviously you need privacy and content, uh, consent. Balance intelligence with discovery. And finally, build inclusive AI teams. Those individuals who are heavily involved with people who have accessibility requirements will be your biggest advocate to build in accessibility into your teams because they have a vested interest to see it work. The others would possibly do it only for bolt-on. And what you'll get then is to drive innovation, because these individuals can look outside the box and they create things like the Seeing AI, a hackathon that we did there. It's an iPhone app that will actually narrate around every, uh, the entire room and it will tell the person how many people in the room, are they happy or sad, the barcode, the, the numbers on uh, currency, items. And you'll do that with the, that diverse team and it'll also give you the ability to do this. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like... She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So in summary, what have we discussed? One, inclusive design. It's an age-old process, and it works. You're driving it every single day. Start inc incorporating it. Understand your persona spectrums. All those spectrum, uh, spectrums are freely available, and they're not only in Microsoft's ecosystem, they're in Google's, they're in AWS, they're in all of the other ecosystems. Two, website standards. Have a look at your website. Run through uh, FastPass. Have a look at Azure DevOps and how you can incorporate it. And three, finally, AI. Let's actually build the fourth industrial revolution with the ability to understand accessibility requirements. Thank you so much. You can access that on acca.ms. LinuxConf, do we have enough time for questions? Yes, we do. Do we have questions? Um, so, obviously, a large portion of this 
talk is focused on kind of end consumer uh, inclusivity in design. Um, but I was just wondering if you've come across any particular, I know like one particular issue that comes up as a developer is like linguistic differences and uh, linguistic differences of coding from left to right rather than right to left. Um, and if you've come up, if you've come across any designs that like address those kinds of inclusivity issues. So one of the things that we have in our AI is Lewis, so conversational AI. And one of the, the principles behind conversational AI is to adjust the conversation based on new information that you learn. So if you misspell a word, it will uh, engage with you and it will start to build up a lexicon of your uh, engagement to cater for uh, the nuances for your dialect. And the South African dialect is very difficult. I have yet to meet one out of the box system that I can actually do it. I usually do this talk in 65 different languages, but because of the presentation uh, layout and the presenter layout, I didn't. But you can also incorporate that kind of capability in any Microsoft product. It's called the Presentation Translator and will allow you to present on any of the other languages. But you can intercept there and say this lexicon is bad and you can feed it the custom lexicon per your dialect. For example, Zulu has more than 200 dialects with small nuances. You might want to actually cater for the one that you're doing there and you want to tweak it to cater for that. So an important thing to understand is conversational AI. Yes, accessibilityinsights.io. So if you go to accessibilityinsights.io, that's where all the tooling is, but also microsoft.com forward slash accessibility has everything that I've mentioned, including the accessibility toolkit on how to get started, along with um, also the persona spectrums and more information around that. Or you can also follow me on Twitter, and I'm keen to help you at any time on your accessibility journey. Um, if I may, maybe just respond to the earlier question. I didn't see who, who raised it about language. Um, I think that in some circles are closely associated with accessibility and sometimes seen as worlds apart for some reason is the matter of internationalization, which I think is actually what you're asking about. And that's a, arguably a far more uh, mature part of, the, of information technology to say designing for a multilingual audience, mm. you know, of which not just maybe up to half is not English, but maybe worldwide up to 80% or I don't know what the latest figures are. And you can get it heinously wrong. So, um, so that's usually called internationalization is the developer part of preparing it to be able to adapt to other cultures or other languages and doing that adaptation for a specific language is usually called localization. The simplest part of it is just translating a user interface, but obviously it can involve uh, up to ad advanced things, uh, li like you mentioned, in terms of uh, the AI-driven stuff or content-generated stuff. Thank you. Great. Um, a really nice talk, Thank you very much.